started realizing that a lot of movies are based in reality. And so that kind of took me down the path of studying Ian Fleming and his life and British intelligence and the, the operations that he was involved in. Doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. The first thing, Jay, and, and welcome to the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, is what are the origins of Hollywood? Because I've heard some real kind of fascinating stuff from, a, from an occult perspective. People do speculate about the name, the Holly branch and all that stuff. Um, but I approached it more from what I was studying in grad school. So I went to philosophy. I went to, to school to study philosophy and film just because I like movies. I always wanted to be an actor, that kind of stuff. And um, ended up not doing that. But I did study film and, and philosophy in, in college and grad school. And I started realizing that a lot of movies are based in reality. And so that kind of took me down the path of studying Ian Fleming and his life and British intelligence and the, the operations that he was involved in. And that was a direct parallel, obviously, to one of the biggest figures in Hollywood, right? I mean, James Bond is iconic. And so I studied how he was used during uh, the Cold War for propaganda. And what I sort of realized was that Hollywood has always been <laughs> an engine of propaganda. Uh, it, it has some fascinating roots, obviously. Um, a lot of different mafias involved in the rise of Hollywood over the years. But the main trek that I took in studying it was as propaganda. So I went and I, I read uh, Edward Bernays, for example, in, in his famous book, Propaganda. He has a chapter where he says that, you know, the greatest engine for, pro for, for propaganda is Hollywood. Movies are the greatest engine the world's ever seen for propaganda. So I started realizing that there was a, a lot of different layers to Hollywood, a lot of different things going on. And then I started noticing uh, that a lot of uh, A-list actors have had been spies or they had been informants. They had been assets, uh, uh, which kind of blew me away because, you know, you, if you hear, the first time you hear that, I remember the first time I heard that, and I was already kind of awake to, you know, how the world really works. I thought that was crazy. It just sounded too much. And then you start reading about, you know, uh, people's biographies, their lives, Jimmy Stewart. Errol Flynn, right? They all actually had a side job where they would get paid to inform and spy on people for the government, for whoever. So uh, I just went further and further down that rabbit hole and it just became obvious to me that there's this fascinating intersection of cults, of intelligence agencies, of occultists, <laughs> of uh, you know, studios, producers, actors, it's all just one big pyramid, you could say, in a way. Uh, and so that's what Hollywood is. Hollywood is a kind of world of its own that, that has just this fascinating history of all of those elements mixing together. And I would say that ultimately, if you study history, it's probably kind of always been that way, you know, all the way back to the, the Globe Theater, right? To, to the, uh, the, the British royalty, you know, they had probably spies in the theater back at the time of Elizabeth and John D. Right. So I think it's always been that way. It's just that now with mass media, with the invention of the camera, with war propaganda films, right. I and mean, that was a big part of the development of the camera was that they realized they could utilize this tool for shooting uh, propaganda. And so they started doing that early on. I mean, some of the uh, biggest movies back in the twenties, right. Howard Hughes, uh, uh, Hell's Angels, these are the, the blockbusters of their day. They were just war propaganda films. That's all they were. So it's kind of always been um, that way in Hollywood. And once you read that and realize it, it's pretty obvious. But that's what Hollywood is, is just a giant engine of propaganda with all these different gears working together. Before we talk about the symbolism that just seems to proliferate, if that's the right word, the whole, the whole of... Hollywood and the music scene and it's not even you know obviously it's not even they don't even tend to hide it now which is kind of weird when you think more and more people know they recognize it now yeah right. who are all these groups that are in play 
I mean, I hear talk of the Khazarian Mafia, the Sabbatean Frankist cult, obviously Illuminati is the, 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 the one that most people know. Then, of course, we've got Freemasonry. Then, of course, we've got, uh, I'm hearing this word te technocracy even more, more and more, which is kind of like a, the corporate influence on our on our lives and the, all the sort of you know the the control as it were what, what 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 are we looking at here are we looking at lots of different groups or are we looking at one kind of um sort of big big brother type agenda or or the way i look at it is is that you can think of it like a pyramid obviously that's pretty common sense everybody's seen that imagery but what confuses people is the fights or the the power struggles that happen at lower levels on the pyramid right so you might have say think of it like a mafia system like we talked about before like you might have one mafia that wants to move in on another mafia and that's probably happening at kind of the middle level of the pyramid and there's a real fat there's a real fight that's happening the Cold War, I view it in a similar way. You know, on the level of espionage, there really were spies for the Soviets and spies for the CIA, you know, doing these different things. Uh, if you watch that TV show, The Americans, they actually show this in a fairly accurate way. I mean, it's obviously it's exaggerated because it's Hollywood, but, you know, that drama takes place during the end of the Cold War. And you've got this family of spies sent over here, the illegals from Russia to, you know, do their uh, uh special operations here while they're, while they're under deep cover. Um, and at the same time running throughout the film is this theme of a managed dialectic, right? So of, of the, of the two sides, but at the top, but over this, this two sided thing is a higher level. <clears throat> and so one of my friends who's a, a, a Russian analyst, he's translated a bunch of old KGB diaries and this kind of stuff from the kernels of the KGB. And one thing that has come to light in these new translations, is that there were certain figures like Victor Rothschild or like uh, Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell's father, they were actually working both sides, British intelligence and the KGB, right? So they were trying to play both sides. And if you read a book like uh, Dr. Carol Quigley's Anglo-American Establishment, uh, this is a, a briefer version of his kind of massive, great tome, Tragedy and Hope, right? He will tell you what's going on. Uh, he lays out the whole plan for the last hundred years and he's an apologist for the establishment, right? So he's writing from the archives of the council on foreign relations from the archives of the CFR, which is one of the most powerful groups that's been around since the twenties, thirties set up by the Rockefeller family set up by these extremely wealthy families in tandem with the Rothschilds uh, in, in the UK. And what they wanted to do was transform the British empire into a global technocratic empire, a secular technocratic empire that would utilize all these different arenas that would utilize people in the black markets that would utilize people in the deep state, uh, the military industrial complex, all of this would come under the aegis of this plan for a world government. It's that simple. So look at it, think of it like this is the big mafia moving in and taking over all the other mafias. That's the way I see it. Um, it was a plan that they concocted a hundred years ago and they went and they recruited all of these academics right, from all these, from Oxford, Cambridge, uh, East coast, U, uh, us universities, Harvard, Yale, skull and bones, right? This is all part of that structure. And they're in on this inner plan to create a global technocratic government that you mentioned Orwell, it's that's kind of what Orwell's describing. Uh, Huxley, he's describing the exact same thing in Brave New World. Uh, if you go read H.G. Wells, his science fiction is all geared towards demonstrating this exact same thing. So that's the way I see it is that at the top, you have the most wealthy families uh, and technocrats, Bill Gates types, Rothschild types, Rockefeller types. They're up there at the top. And then below them, they, they have what they call the managerial class. And this is mentioned in, in the Quigley book. It's mentioned in more recent books by global elitists like David Rothkopf. And this is about 6,000 people who manage everything. This is the corporate elite, the CEOs, the people that are 
uh, working at the NGOs, think tanks, foundations, Rand Corporation, Carnegie, Mellon, you know, all this kind of stuff, university heads. And that's who kind of manages everything. And they pull and recruit from the people who go to the universities, right? And then kind of below this managerial class, you have like the intelligence agencies and, uh, you know, lower level tel uh, people who are out there doing things who they think, you know, is for some greater good, some good, some noble cause or whatever. Heads of churches, right? They're, they're all kind of co-opted into this as well. They don't even realize they're serving this, this big system. So that's how I see it playing out. And so. And we can, Jay, talking we can, about, we, yeah. we, we can add education obviously to that and. Absolutely. And, and, and social work and these kind of yeah. social enterprises that profess to be benevolent and good, but in reality just. It's all kind of this top-down serving stuff. a higher tier on this uh, ladder on this pyramid. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, the the cults that you were mentioning, like quote Illuminati, that's kind of a generic catch-all phrase that's been used by a lot of different groups in history. I mean, there was a historic quote Illuminati with Adam Weishaupt and all that, and they were kind of like Enlightenment uh, free thinkers, Enlightenment atheists. Um, they weren't really occultists per se. But they did kind of transmit an, an idea of revolutionary thought and philosophy that would influence um, other revolutionary movements. Communism, this kind of stuff, does have a, a lineage back to Adam Weishaupt through people like uh, Giuseppe Mazzini and uh, uh, even, even Albert Pike. People like that can be uh, classed as revolutionary philosophers, you could say. And they're part of that revolutionary tradition. Other groups like Crowley and the Ordo Templi, like the OTO and... Uh, you know, his, his stuff, they'll call themselves the Illuminati too, but they're more of like a, a ceremonial magic, black magic kind of thing. Um, so you've got a lot of different groups using this term, but really, in my view, they're all part of this same pyramid and they might be at different, you know, bricks on this pyramid, you know. Uh, but as we, as we get up to the top, I don't think there's any question that, you know, the, the wealthiest families, um, even the Vatican, you know, they're all part of this pyramid now. Yeah. Does it go higher than them, Jay, do you think? Because I've heard the Rothschilds are just, you know, they're just like puppets again. For, for You know, it could be. Um, uh, I've heard that thesis as well. Uh, but I just, try to, I just try to stick with what I can document. And I, I can document from the establishment themselves in their writings that, you know, those families are up. Milner, uh, Cecil Rhodes, you know, these are some of the, the most powerful people last century who's, who really set up the system that's coming into, into play. Uh, are there people above that older families, black nobility? It's entirely possible. Uh, and I'm open to, you know, any evidence that people have for that. These, these people don't really have the best interest of the rest of the world in their hearts. The second thing is, is what they're doing. It's pretty evil. And unless there's some benevolent agenda that, that, that we've, we've all been blinded, to or we can't we're not clever enough to see so is it a stretch then to think that they belong to these esoteric cults yeah you know, black no, magic uh, um yeah no i think a lot of them a lot of them do right a lot of them do have a, an esoteric bent to their to their worldview um, maybe not everybody. I mean, for example, I've never found evidence that uh, David Rockefeller, I've never found evidence that he himself had any esoteric views, but other members in the Rockefeller family did. Uh, uh, Edith, I think one of the uh, sisters, the older sisters of the Rockefeller family, she thought that she was the reincarnation of Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> she went and talked to Carl Jung and they did some kind of regression nonsense and Carl Young was like, Oh yeah, uh, uh, you're a reincarnated bride of Pharaoh. All right. And so, so there's definitely that background. If we look at um, the philosophy of the United Nations, uh, Alice Bailey, Annie Besant, Hel Helena Blavatsky, they were openly into this Luciferian theosophy type of worldview. A lot of the early uh, founders of that, what they call the society of the elect. This is the people around Milner, Rhodes, Rothschild, that were setting up this coming world order. A lot of them were really into new age stuff. They were into mesmerism. They were into Christian science, which is kind of similar to theosophy and new age in certain ways. 
So definitely a lot of these families do have that. Um, there's a lot of wealthy elites in the U S rich families. I'm talking about super rich families, uh, that have interest in the occult. Um, the Duke children have come out in interviews saying that their family was involved in, uh, occultic stuff. So there's no shortage to stories that have come out about that. But I would say at the top, yeah, even, even people who don't even know if they're serving something evil could still be serving something evil because I believe that it's a spiritual reality that's even higher. Uh, you know, you probably heard David Icke talking about this kind of stuff. I think he's, I don't agree with every position of David Icke, but I think that when he talks about that, there being like a higher level of spiritual entities. I've interviewed uh, Dr. Richard Spence, who wrote a book on uh, how Crowley worked for British intelligence as an asset. And he thinks that where the British establishment got the idea for their version of MK Ultra was actually from Crowley's drug diaries, which I think is pretty plausible because you see uh, people like Leary and John C. Lilly directly referencing Alistair Crowley saying, oh, yeah, we're going to continue the work that he did, right? So there's this conscious and, and I tracked down, I read uh, Lily's autobiography. And if you don't know, he's the crazy guy who came up with the dolphin, like giving uh, dolphins LSD, making flip or trip. <laughs> right. And, th and this was all done at the behest of the uh, office of Naval intelligence. Right. Well, then he moved on to working in brain chips and putting chips in people's brains and, you know, working with signals and frequencies. This is all in his bi biography. It's not, it's not hidden. Um, uh, and then he moved into working in the float tanks. So if you've ever seen that movie with William Hurt, uh, Altered States, that uh, late 70s, early 80s movie, that's actually about John C. Lilly. And he was all doing that under the, the aegis of um, the Office of Naval Intelligence and the CIA in the, in, the, in the U.S. And all of that was about him going into the float tank so that he could speak to, you know, have this sort of interaction with these entities. Now, a lot of these people think it was aliens. I don't think it's aliens. I think it's spiritual, spiritual beings, basically demons. They, they say the same thing that demons have said, that shaman throughout the history of you know, planet Earth have all had the same interactions. They all say the same stuff. So I think that's what was going on. But what's fascinating is that whether it's Leary or Terrence McKenna or John C. Lilly, they all say that they're – getting kind of ideas and inspiration and, and even maybe technology from these entities. That's the fascinating part. My gosh, it's, yeah, it, it, it's hard to know. Yeah. It's hard to know. Um, I think this, this former seal that I spoke to Jay, when he talked about ETs, I, I don't think he was referring to like the space, you know, the space, got space little spacemen sort of thing i think he just was using extraterrestrials like not of this earth sort of thing you know yeah uh, right yeah i agree is that an actual thing do you think or do you think it's like metaphorical or do you think it's in people's minds because people say to me when i talk about addiction and i lost my mind for on and off for six months right and I remember it very well. I mean, I've written written my book, Eating Smoke, about it. And when I describe it to people, I say, if you take crystal meth every day for pretty much six months and you've got to take increasing quantities as you get more and more um, kind of uh, used to it, um, finally, you're, you're putting such strong chemical into the synapses of your brain that rather than fire like this, they, they start doing this. And so you start to not make sense of, of your world, right? And then, and then I've had people in my comment section go, Chris, that's you take this. If you take drugs, you open yourself to the spiritual realm, and in come the 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 jinns, you know, the the I don't know if they're evil spirits, but they 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 seize that to control you. And yeah, as a metaphor, I'd say that's brilliant metaphor you know because there's your higher self your, your spiritual self and and your lower self so your animal self and we know that if we keep ourselves in 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 this area that's your kind of like your good angel stuff and if you do the stuff from the waist down the, the greed the the you know the, the jealousy gluttony too much sex or, or 
lust, um, that this stuff's going to make it unhappy. And of course, taking a poison every day for six months, i.e. a drug, is kind of going to destroy your connection with God or, or nature or universe, whatever, whatever we want to call that. Right. And when you, when you, when you've destroyed your, 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 your shrine, as it were, your temple, and you're down there instead of like vibrating up here, then you do, you know, you are having mental health issues. And now, as I said, I can get it if that's, like a metaphor for these gins coming in, but it, it's hard for someone like me. It seems a real stretch that people actually think these are, these are entities, but I mean, like, what do I know? You know, let me give you uh, here's my argument why I think they are real entities. So, well, first of all, I've had a bad trip, so I've had good trips and bad trips. So I know what a bad trip's like, and I've, I've had interaction with an entity on one bad trip, but I'm not going to use that as my argument because you could just say, well, that's just a, you know, like you said, that's just a manifestation of your mind. It's just chemicals reacting. It's a mental phenomenon. It's not a real thing. There's a book by a famous uh, uh, comparative religion scholar. His name is Merkia Iliada. He's a Romanian. He's probably the most famous comparative religion scholar. He wrote a book on shamanism the book's just called shamanism <clears throat> and he went and studied all the shamanic traditions and tribes that he could famous oxford publication and what he found was that there is a pattern to all of them a consistent pattern to every one of these shamanic traditions and experiences now not every experience of the shamanic you know stuff is exactly the same but there is a, enough of a consistent pattern of the process of what happens to the shaman uh, that he concludes that there's something going on more than just a mental, I mean, a mental state. So if it was just a mere mental state, nobody has the exact same mental state, right? So there's got to be some kind of underlying reality beyond just the purely synapse firing type of thing. So I think that book is a pretty good case, even just setting aside, you know, uh, speculations about religious traditions just looking at the data of the patterns in different shamanic traditions that um, in my view, there's something more going on than, than just a metaphor. I mean, there is a metaphor, but there's also something more than just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Jay, let's peel back to, to Hollywood if we may, because um, my understanding is, you know, they're doing all these signs and, and I, I, I'm guessing I don't know that these celebrities don't really know what they're doing or they conveniently tie on a blind eye because, you know, if you're told to cover your eye in a photo shoot and then, you, you know, you're going to get a million dollars in your bank account every year, then I'm guessing for people that, that desperately crave fame and adulation, which a lot of people who've been damaged in their lives do, it's why I started writing. I wanted to be famous, you know, I wanted, I wanted my five minutes of fame at least, right? I wouldn't have gone to the, I don't think I would have sold myself to the, to the devil to use the, the parlance. Um, but who, it's like, let's talk about it because who is making them do it? Or maybe they're involved in these cults and, and, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure some, of, some of them are because you look at, you know, no disrespect, Mr. Bono, but, you just don't look right, mate. You know, you don't look right. Um, and of course, you know, they, they can't be blind to these lyrics that they're, that they're singing and the stuff they're having to do in the music videos. Um, and so what, what is going on there, Jay, do you think? And also why does it so much seem to be along the lines of the Masonic symbology that, that we see, you know, the checkerboard and the, the eye of Horus and this kind of thing. Good question. So I would say that, yeah, most people going into entertainment, they don't know any of this stuff. I mean, I used to do stand up and I would, you know, I'd go out to clubs and I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to do, I had no idea what was going on. I just thought, I thought, well, you, you go and if you are the most talented, if you're good, then you're going to rise to the top, right? But then you quickly learn <laughs> that that's not how the world really works. It's not based around talent. One thing that's in important to see is like bloodlines, dynasties, right? Hollywood dynasties. 
So a lot of the children of the stars who've been abused go into stardom and they become stars. And so they kind of perpetuate that cycle. A lot of those families are, are uh, involved in cults. They've been involved in these different control st- structures. You know, Hollywood has a lot of Freemasons. It has a lot of Kabbalists. It has a lot of Satanists. It has a lot of Crowleyans. I mean, you've got all these different co- new agers, right? I mean, uh, Hindus. I mean, they're, they're basically, it's, it's a plethora of different cults and families involved in long-term cults. And even some of those cults have been, you know, exposed as pedophile cults, right? You think about the, uh, the, the children of God cult, right? With, uh, you know, you've got Rose McGowan, you've got, uh, River Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix, you know, they come out of that, uh, well-connected kind of cult famously well-known. So all of that's going on, um, all at once. And so the symbolism, again, like you said, for a lot of the people who want to move out to Hollywood to be famous or whatever, they don't know what's going on, but at those higher levels, they do know what's going on. And so think of it like a military. Uh, I mean, you've talked about military, you know, it's compartmentalized, right? You've got the, the, the enlisted soldier. He doesn't know what the general's up to, right? Because the knowledge is compartmentalized. Even people, uh, my dad was on a, a, a ship and, you know, he worked on one gun on the ship. And he would get a message. He was told to push the button when it was ready to fire, right? <laughs> but he didn't know what the, the, the captain was up to, right? He didn't know what intelligence the captain was getting and why they were doing He was just doing what he was told to do. And so in the same way, you know, um, mafias work that way. It's compartmentalized. The information is compartmentalized. Big operations like Manhattan Project work that way. People will be working on one part of the bomb. They don't know what's going on the other side of the, the factory or what this is all going together to make. So – the world is run in that same way and Hollywood's run that same way. You've got these different characters at higher levels. And if you think about something like masonry, I mean, Albert Pike says in uh, morals and dogma, he says that the lower levels, he says, we intentionally don't tell them what's up. He says, we intentionally give them misinformation. <laughs> so we tell them a bunch of baloney, right? And it's not until people get higher and higher in this, this uh, ladder, you know, pyramid structure that they have a higher, uh, a bigger picture view of what's going on. I mean, think about it like a mountain. If you're at the base of the mountain, you can't see what's going on. You know, you're you, you can only see the tree line, right? But the higher you get up that to the top of that mountain, you can see the whole big scale picture, right? That's the way I think all this stuff works. Gosh, yes. And so are they trying to, my understanding of these kind of cults is they believe by draining your power, they, they gain that power. So by getting you to be negative, it's not like they get positive. It's just that they, that energy feed, that feeds their needs and, and makes them, makes them all, all powerful, so to speak. And you can see it. I mean, to me, to me, Jay, it's so obvious when you've got a rock concert, and let's just say the stage is set up like if you know what you're looking for, it's it's more like an altar than a than a than a rock concert, right? And good point, yeah. You got the red light there and the you know, red and black symbolism and all, all this stuff. And then you've got this crowd that are so uh, you, you know, you've got a, a star there and he's um what's the word, adulate, you know, he's craving that adulation. You can see the star, he or she is soaking that up. It means so much to them, right? You can see why they, they, you know, they would sign a deal if it was offered to them because this is just from a broken childhood and because you're good at singing, you're suddenly, you, you, you're getting 10, 20, sometimes 30,000 people singing your name. And then when you look at the crowd and they're, they're just like, <sighs> well, I think the, the system knows how to play to people's weakness and to their vanity. And so if you're talking about the star, yeah, a lot of times people are kind of groomed and they're, they're, they're prepped to play that role. Um, and it really feeds into just their narcissism, right? So it, to have a narcissistic pop star or whatever, uh, 
it helps if that person has been, as you said, damaged or they had a dysfunctional family. And the same thing goes for people who go into, uh, you know, intelligence work or whatever. A lot of times those are people who um, have been traumatized uh, intentionally. Uh, and, and wealthy families have for a long time known this and they've done it on purpose. They, they've intentionally traumatized their children to make them into kind of buttholes. Right? I mean, uh, to be a, a leader in the system, you've got to be a total butthole. Uh, with no empathy and that kind of stuff. So they try to breathe the empathy out of people uh, intentionally. It actually, Quigley talks about that, you know, at the end of uh, Tragedy and Hope, he talks about how there's a, the, the, the elite would intentionally, for example, send their children away in the formative years so that they would not have a uh, parental familial attachment, so that they would lose that aspect of their, of their self to become kind of these uh, narcissistic sort of sociopathic monster types and that's done on purpose. It's done. It's done. The, the elites have done that for millennia on purpose. They know how to do that stuff, which is, which is sad, but that's what they do. So, so that's going on. And at the same time, uh, the purpose of like a ritual of a big ceremony, you know, we think about the, the Super Bowl halftime show and all this kind of nonsense and the, the Olympic games and all this weird imagery at the, at the, that's to focus everybody's attention. You see, you've got millions of people's attention focused on this, billion, perhaps maybe even a billion or more. And then you do this ritual that's supposed to speak to the subconscious. That's supposed to tra it transmits a message, even if the conscious audience doesn't know it or can't see it. They don't even know. But this is being implanted in the subconscious, and they're being ritually programmed. That's the purpose of all this. And if if that sounds crazy, well, just go read Sun Tzu. Go read any classic work of psychological warfare and you will get those same principles there you will get the 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 idea that for example there's a uh, uh, a famous chapter in machiavelli's book art of war uh he wrote a version of uh, of art of war just like our, uh, sun tzu had art of war machiavelli wrote a separate book called art of war and in book six he talks about all the different psychological tricks to play on the 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 opponent, right? Wartime, if you study wartime, you know this, you know that there's all kinds of tricks that you play on the enemy to dupe them, to demoralize them. That's the whole purpose of it, right? So the elite, they know how to use all those same tricks on the population as a whole to demoralize them, right? So what you talked about, that psychic vampirism is absolutely real, right? The, the stars operate like these little figures that sort of suck in the attention and the energy of the, the masses, and then uh, they feed back into the masses whatever demoralization me uh, message that they want to send. And it has a kind of, like a lot of things in life, isn't it, that there's other implications as well, because you've got all these masses that rather than looking to attain this kind of uh, higher power themselves, um, which you can easily do through through just getting spiritual, eating a good diet, running around the block twice a week, and loving your family, right? As I'm always saying, you know, paradise is in your head. But because they've been controlled their whole life and fed the the, the rubbish food and the alcohol and the coffee and, and 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 the junk TV, and they've been broken down by magazines that tell them they're ugly. And, and all of this and TV that makes them scared, scared, scared. And of course they look up to this megastar mm. and they're, they're living, uh, is it vicariously through this, but it's like, wow, you know, it's Prince. Oh, oh. And of course that's really powerful because it means that the people don't bandy together to work on themselves and get, and, and, and get this satisfaction in their own lives. It's, it's a bit like football, isn't it? They call it opiate for the, for the masses. Um, there just seems to be so many different agendas in play. And I'll just name a few, and maybe you'd feel free to chip in, but you've got this feminization of the masculine, you know. You can see it on TV where they seem to, for some reason, they seem to want to make black men dress as women as often as possible. And if that you know, sounds a bit bizarre to anyone at home, just, just Google it, you know. Every, every one of your black stars has been made to dress up as a woman at, at least one point in their career, if not more. Um, 
um, you've you've got the Masonic symbolism blaring out of, of, of Hollywood and the music industry. Um, you've got the 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 whole kind of um, uh, the agenda was agenda 21 and it's now what, agenda 30, the kind of control you in your own home, control what you see on the internet, control your energy supply. Maybe we have chips in our hand and that's our digital currency. Basically can treat complete control of the human being and the ability, I guess, to switch you, switch you off if you don't comply. Um, you've again got like the, the war agenda where people, these corporations that the, the military industrial complexes clearly create these conflicts. You know, you've got your pyramid and let's just say you've got cubes within the pyramid or pyramids within the pyramid. And of course they all interlock, don't they? You know, and then you might Absolutely. get one pyramid that actually encompasses six or nine other pyramids inside the pyramid. Right. Right. Is it something like this? Or is all this just like one agenda that that either people discover it in their life or they don't? Um, I would you know. say that uh, if we want to use another military um, idea, the Pentagon uh, some years back came up with what they called full spectrum dominance. And that's really the, the game plan here. I mean, that was the U.S. military. But remember, the, the U.S. military, the Pentagon, those are just that's just a tool of these mega corps, right? I mean, they work for these big uh, military industrial complexes, big, the defense contractors, all that big pharma. It's all part of the same uh, uh, power structure. And the Pentagon is just one arm of that. Um, and, and when they say what we're going to do in the next 20, 30, 50 years is full spectrum dominance, they literally mean every area of life. Like you mentioned, education, uh, biology, the biosphere, right? geoengineering. It's very real. In fact, the head of Davos, uh, he just wrote a book, The Shaping of the Future of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. He's got a whole chapter on geoengineering. But if you talk about geoengineering, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. But if the head of Davos, where all the elite go and meet <laughs> once a year, this big uh, party, when he writes a book and talks about it, oh, it's, uh, oh, hail this ge great genius who writes about it. But if you talk about it, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. I mean, again, it's all areas of life. It's nanotech, it's, it's uh, uh, psychological warfare, it's the arts, it's the biosphere, it's education, it's religion. All areas of the life of life come under this overall plan. And I'm glad you mentioned the eco stuff because that's what they dreamt up back at the Club of Rome meeting uh, many years ago. If you look up this book called The First uh, Global Revolution, the Club of Rome, which is one of these elite think tanks, they said that the the new problem that we would uh, invent for everybody is the environment and pollution. They said will be the key for us to say that the real pollutant is humans in general. And they admit that it's just made up. <laughs> they said, we will come up with a new problem to unify everybody and it'll be this eco cult. So, uh, and that makes perfect sense because you read other elitist in the Royal society circles like Arthur Kessler and ghost in the machine. And Kessler says in Ghost in the Machine that, yeah, we got to bring back uh, human sacrifice. We got to bring back cannibalism, blood cults, right? You were asking elites that are into that stuff. Well, there's one right there. He says, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Let's bring it all back. Let's just have a giant Amazon Aztec cult <laughs> running everything and we'll worship the planet. And what we'll do is that'll get rid of a large portion of the population. And then we can move into the next phase of evolution, which is transhumanism in their view. You said about the conditioning as children, and we all know about attachment theory. Was it Dr. Bowlby said, if a child is not with its parents at a certain age, I think attachment theory is actually really young age. Like, so when it's an infant, yeah. then it, it lacks, it does it doesn't understand empathy. So basically, it's on its road to, to becoming a sociopath, right? Yeah. And so these public school, what we call private schools in the UK, public schools. I don't know why we do that, but, but we do. It's where all the kind of rich, you know, hoi polloi send their kids. And so I've got this kind of picture that, you know, your dad's an international banker, your mum's a jet setter, whatever. You, 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 you're a kid 
you probably had nannies, so you haven't had your real mother and father look after you at all much in your life. Then you get to five years old and you're farmed off to a to a boarding school, a private, you know, like, like um, yeah, I don't even know know the know, know the names of them, but um, and then of course you don't have that parental connection at all. Your your maternal and paternal figure becomes the boy that's like in the year older than you or two years or the the guys that are going to bully you right and then of course your first sexual experience is probably one of these guys either touching you up so you basically you're a little sociopath already (laughs) sorry children i'm just i'm just putting this scenario scenario out there you're a little sociopath already now your role models are pretty mucked up what i'm trying to get at jay is where the hell does this mass scale abuse take place? You know, or, or I mean, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't expect you to know. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on it. Um, all I can go with is what I've, you know, proven. I mean, there's a lot of speculation out there. Um, I know that there was speculation because of Hunter S. Thompson. You know, he would talk about adrenochrome. There's speculation about that. I don't, I don't know the details of that. Um, I have a friend who's a chemist and he says that, you know, this stuff can easily be synthesized. So I don't, I don't know if they have to like have giant farms. I mean, it could be, I don't know. There've been cases, you know, where people, like you said, have, you know, obviously busted a lot of uh, human trafficking and that kind of stuff. So I don't know about that in particular, but I can think of a couple books that do discuss um, like Kurth Barker has an interesting book where he talks about his experiences. He alleges that he went through some of this stuff when he was a kid. Um, again, it's just firsthand accounts, but what's interesting is that what he wrote in that book, a lot of what he said would take place in the next five, 10 years has happened. So I'll give him credit for, um, predicting a lot of what's happened. And he does discuss some of this, this stuff and, he doesn't mention the scale of it, but he says that, you know, this is what goes on at a lot of these, you know, really elite mansions out in the country, this kind of stuff. So, so all I can say is what, you know, is in the books that are out there, like uh, uh, the Franklin cover up book, uh, you know, Kurt Barker's book. Um, I don't trust Malachi Martin. I think he's a dubious character, but he talked about this stuff going on in the Vatican back in the, you know, eighties and nineties. So it's definitely, there's definitely reality to it, but to, as to the scale, I don't know, but as to how prevalent the human sacrifice is, I'm not sure. Although I will say that when the FBI declassified their stuff on the finders and the famous McMartin case, it turns out there were tunnels. So this thing that the so-called conspiracy theorists have talked about that the media would say, ah, you're crazy. There's no tunnels. Ha ha ha. You're an idiot. Well, all turns out in the FBI, declassified documents there were tunnels so that wasn't made up it's funny i mean after i spoke to 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 rob uh robbie williams that is for people that don't haven't seen that um podcast and he's also gone on to do another interview with a, with a former bbc journalist now and like my god they it's interesting when i chatted to him they came in and they did articles, but it was only on the pop stuff, you know, the tacky, superficial, he said this about this pop star, and that was as deep as it went, right? For this um, other journalist, it's gone a bit deeper now, but, but only as far as they've come out and they've called him wacky for uh, talking about Pizzagate, right? They got it wrong. They said he was supporting the theory, but he wasn't. He was saying... My jury is out. I, I, I'm not saying it's happened. I'm not saying it haven't. I don't know. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a could, could be a fair argument. But um, I've just kind of got this thing, you know, if Wikipedia calls it a conspiracy theory, then, well, you know, it, it kind of means it's true, right? The mainstream media call it conspiracy, then it's kind of true. Yeah, I mean, in that particular case, I don't know the exact details. Uh, a lot of it's uh, uh, unclear. I mean, obviously, something crazy is going on. Um, we Again, there have been many, many cases of documented, you know, trafficking. So, I mean, I think it would be more beneficial if people focused on the things that are documented. But people love to speculate and they love to, I'm not saying there's nothing going on. I'm just saying people love to kind of speculate about stuff when 
it's a lot easier to look at the real documented cases. I mean, you mentioned the UK and the US. I mean, how many instances have we had of human trafficking busted? You know, how many cases of, of Sandusky's and Savills? And I mean, it comes out all the time and yet people are going to spend all day speculating. I mean, we don't have to speculate because there's countless cases <laughs> that keep coming out of people caught doing this stuff. So mm-hmm. why would it even be like, why, why is it crazy to speculate when there's countless cases where it's real and documented court cases? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I haven't looked a lot at this kind of, is it ninth circle stuff? And there's undoubtedly, well, I don't know about that. Like I'm not been, I'm just talking about again, what things are. And I'm not saying, Oh, well then I trust the mainstream media. I'm just, again, going with what I can prove. Uh, and when something's in court, that's a much better case for it being real than yeah. just kind of people speculating online, which is again, not to say that there was nothing going on or that I know for sure what's going on. Yeah. If the football league, the premier league is your main educator in life, that's what you're going to believe. Right. You know, that's yeah. Well, put, uh, I yeah. mean, I mean that no disrespect. It's just the truth. That's, that's just, just how yeah, it it's is. the same yeah. way in the U S people, you know, worship the NFL. It's, it's a, that's, that's what they live for. Yeah. And it does, it serves a very important function. It, keeps people's mind off off of what you know the the of, of community spirit and talking yeah. to people and other than talking about football obviously um but yeah no so so that i get that a lot i think people still feel like they've got to be the apologists for for for, for seeking the truth and i i like everybody i meet now just knows the truth just, yeah, I mean, if, if if after Epstein, you still can't figure out what's going on, there's no hope for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My only thing is, is I, I try to get people not... What, Robbie Williams came up with a great expression. He said, don't be a red pillock, right? So, meaning, uh, don't be a person that grabs hold of every single theory out there and believe in it, because obviously a lot of them are put out by the CIA. CIA. Yeah, there's a lot of disinfo, absolutely. Yeah. Disinformation, like all the JFK stuff that is, is now, we now know obviously comes from shadow government, three magic bullets or whatever it, whatever it, whatever it is. But my, my thing is, I just say to people, yeah, always keep your jewelry up, your, your jury out you know could you uh, give your books a shout out so we know know what they are yeah uh i did esoteric hollywood one and esoteric hollywood two and uh they focus on kind of my weird way of doing uh film analysis so i do about mm, 80 pages of kubrick and then i go into science fiction how it programs us what we're supposed to why science fiction was so important to the establishment. Um, then I go into intelligence agencies in Hollywood towards the end. And then in the second book, I went into areas that I kind of overlooked, like relationship between different mafias in Hollywood, cults in Hollywood. Uh, and then I get into MK Ultra in Hollywood, how it's presented. And then it ends with transhumanism in Hollywood. So you can get those books at my website, jaysanalysis.com. And then uh, I have uh, TV show, uh, Hollywood Decoded, full production TV show at Gaia TV, where we basically took the information in the book. And then my website is jasonalysis.com, where you can get my lectures and talks, uh, where I cover a lot of these writings of the elite and uh, kind of summarize those. And then uh, recently, last few days, I've, I've been, uh, uh, yesterday I hosted the Alex Jones show. So uh, you can find my stuff at band.video as well. Right, and I'm going to put all your links underneath the YouTube. So anybody who's listening on iTunes or whatever wants to find it, just go to my YouTube channel. They'll all be there. Um, so for people listening, MK Ultra was a Project Monarch, as in like uh, named after the butterfly, was a CIA um, project back in there. I don't know if we're talking 60s that... Well, it began in, I think, the late 40s where they were looking for a, a truth serum, and it was under the aegis of the military initially. Um, and like I said, there was a kind of a British uh, version of it with earlier on with Huxley and Tavistock Institute and all that. But in the U.S., um, MKUltra itself was just one of the many sub-projects of the overarching 
mind control projects of the of the CIA that began, like I said, uh, it was military, and then it transitioned into the CIA in the fifties and sixties. Big pharma had a big role in that, um, and what they were looking for was, like I said, initially a truth serum, but then it kind of morphed into bio warfare. Uh, so it, it became these other projects at Fort Detrick became in case search where they were trying to look for the different ways that chemicals could alter human consciousness, human thought. Uh, there's a lot of great books on this. Uh, there's Walter Bowert's book, operation mind control. Uh, there's a uh, uh, search for the Manchurian candidate by John Marks. Uh, my book has uh, multiple chapters that discuss it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of public information that's out about this now. That's pretty, uh, it's a lot of, not everything, but a lot of it's declassified. Um, and so who knows where they've taken it since then, but, uh, it, it was always connected. What a lot of people don't know about this was that it was always connected to, um, electronics research, signals, research, ELF, VLF, brain chips, that was always part of MKUltra, right? It wasn't just a mind control uh, LSD thing. It, all of these things were part of this overarching study to master the domain of the mind. Mm. And, and a kind of a, a red flag for me there is whenever the security agencies come out and say, oh, we don't do that anymore. It's a what you have the ability to control someone's mind to, to make <laughs> the perfect assassin, yeah. and you want us to believe you just you drop that project, you, right? Okay, you know it's almost. I may, maybe I'm being a bit naive on it. I think it's well, you know what's what, what's more important than the the assassin thing. That was just one aspect of it with uh, uh, Doctor uh, Ewan Cameron and and Gottlieb and all that. But there was a applying the principles that they learned to the mass population. That's what it was really about. It's not so much about creating some so-called assassin. It's about what did we learn in these test cases with individuals that we can apply on a mass scale. That's what it's about. But I do think that some of these people, if you watch the interview with Britney Spears, I mean, she seems to have altered personalities. So. Yeah. It's, it's crazy for, for yeah. people listening that, uh, and, and, to Al, if you ever get to watch this, no, no, I mean, no offense to you, but it's very bizarre. So you've got this TV uh, personality, generally a sort of presenter type chap, and he's uh, in this outside audience and he's doing his talking bit with a couple of other presenters. And one of them turns to him and speaks. And when that person says the, the phrase, Holy Ghost, which is just in in the conversation. Da -da -da, yeah, the Holy Ghost. He goes, and he's just flops into this trance, staring dead ahead. These two continue talking away, and then they're like, and and you see this a lot in these presenters. It's this isn't just like a one-off. There's numerous. Yeah. Um, much video footage of this happening. There's that Wendy, the, the black woman. I, I, she's got like a daytime show. She just suddenly starts freaking out and screaming in the middle of one of her things. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a subjective type person. I'm probably like you, Jay. I lean to the ob objective. And yet you don't know that this couldn't have been put on. You don't know it, it might not be some kind of like one of these Illuminati um, where the celebrity has to go and make a fool of themselves because that seems to be part like of Like a humiliation ritual, yeah. Yeah, the humiliation ritual, you know, like when Kanye goes and tries to grab the, the music award off, off th this kind of thing, right? But, but um, I really, it really does seem like these people have these split personalities. Many do, uh, you know, how many, I don't know, but they, at times they talk about it. Um, you know, Beyonce seems to hint at that at times, uh, whether she's playing that up or I don't know, but, uh, I think Britney Spears pretty clearly does. I don't think she was acting. She's not a very good actress. <laughs> so, so in that, uh, Barbara Walt, that famous Barbara Walters interview, she seems to, um, uh, Anna Nicole Smith, if you watch old clips of her, she seemed yeah. to have these dissociation, uh, spells, uh, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys claims to have these 
dissociation spells. So uh, that does happen. Um, but as to how many of the pop stars actually have that, it's hard to say. But there is some reality to that, absolutely. Yeah. And just one aspect I, I, I've i mulled over is, if you think about it, these people, in the, they're in the public eye. They must be many rich men's fantasy, these gorgeous looking, you know, news, news presenters who, who all look stunning and these celebrity pop stars that are, you know, at the top of their top of their game and it it because one of the mk ultra thing was the sex kitten one wasn't it you know they, they you, mm -hmm. you say you say the keyword and they turn into this sex bomb and they're, mm -hmm. they're, um, yeah there was uh, yeah attempts to create uh, like a sex slave yeah absolutely because when you see like a newscaster and they break down and they they suddenly can't talk they go uh, 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 uh that like like this it's weird right and you're thinking well hang on why would they control a newscaster i mean to do that job you're gonna have, you you probably got to be the sort of person that's just got to lie for a living any you know tell tell the sociopaths lies and not question it which they obviously don't but then of course you think well hang on a sec this is a really pretty woman and there's 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 millions of people watch her every day well, that's the story of Candy Jones. I mean, she's one of the famous, uh, uh, Donald Bain wrote a book about her. She's the famous kind of monarch sex kitten that supposedly was one of the first. Um, and she claims a lot of that stuff. She comes up in the Walter Bowert book. Uh, I mentioned her story in my book. Uh, but there's other stories of uh, people who've gone through that as well. The, the Kurth Barker book mentions that, of the, the sex slaves. Um, and I would not be surprised if, yeah, some of these pop stars haven't also been through some kind of, uh, sex kitten thing because yeah, I mean, I mean, there was a story a long time ago about, I won't say who, but one of the big pop stars admittedly, she said, yeah, I was paid, uh, I don't know how many thousands of dollars to go sleep with one of the sheiks, right? Some Arab sheik dude paid, uh, I don't know how much. And, uh, she said, yeah, I was, I went and I did it for, you know, $50,000 or however much it was. So, you know, if that's going on and, and they have the uh, opportunity to, you know, be around world leaders, this kind of stuff, there's a lot of information that could be had there, right? You get a, you get a, uh, I mean, intelligence agencies have used swallows, ravens and swallows. A raven is a male uh, sex gigolo operative. A, a swallow is a female. I mean, that's gone on for millennia. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, thank you. Um, you're obviously a man that knows, knows your stuff. It's um, very impressive. Thanks, man. I appreciate um, it. So, Jay, just stay on the line while I say goodbye to our wonderful friends at home. So, wonderful friends at home, thank you for watching. I hope you found that as fascinating uh, as I have. Thank you for watching the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. Big love and respect to you and your families. Please like and subscribe if indeed you did like. And uh, see you next time.